Stocks higher today after cooler than expected reading on producer prices ease some investor concerns that the Fed may not begin cutting rates till later in the year. And that's exactly how our first guest today thinks it is going to play out. Let's welcome in Rick Reeder, BlackRock's Chief Investment Officer of Global Fixed Income. Rick, it is always good to have you on the show. Let's start with that inflation reading, Rick. March PPI came in below <laughs> consensus. Interest, Rick, just to get your take. Um, what did you make of that, of that report, Rick? And what do you think Jay Powell makes of it? So I think the markets took a uh, took a deep breath on today's report and, uh, and and got some satisfaction around. You know, yesterday's report was concerning to the market. I mean, it's you know it's interesting when you actually take PPI. It's a big component in the get into what gets into the Fed's thinking around core PCE, and this gives you a bit of comfort around uh, around those numbers. You know, which we think you know are going to settle in around the two point six two point seven percent level for core PCE. So I think part of why the equity market is uh, has gotten a bit of relief today is on the back side of it. Listen, the data yesterday in CPI was concerning, but it's really the service sector that is really uh, seeing this sort of level of inflation, which is hard for the Fed to bring down, and a question of how much are they going to fight that over the coming months. Well, that is the big question of how much they're going to fight that, right? Because we've had some of your peers on yeah. the street, including folks at Deutsche Bank, Bank of America now, coming out today and saying, only one cut is going to happen this year. Where are you in terms of your number of cuts? Where are you guys? So I, I'd say a couple of things. I'd say I think the Fed would like to still get a couple of cuts in. I mean, if you break down where that inflation comes from, you know, look at things like insurance, healthcare, education. They're not terrible. I mean, those are primary drivers of where it's happening. They're not cyclical. They're not influenced by the interest rate. And what's happening is you're creating a tax on lower income, a tax on local banks because the rate is so high today. I still think they'd like to get a couple in. Listen, I wouldn't argue with is the number today you're only going to get one or two cuts in for 2024. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a reasonable possibility. But you know, we got to see the data over the next couple of months. Our sense is you'll see start to see some better inflation data over the next couple of months that'll give the Fed a window. And I quite frankly, I th think they'd like to see that window. When you have funds rate. That's five and three. I said, you have a core PCE at two, six, two, you know, let's say it only is two, six, two, seven. It doesn't get down to two and a half. You're still very restrictive and, and putting pressure on parts of the economy, probably unduly. You know, there are, though, given the inflation reports we've gotten here over the last few months, there has a question been raised about whether the Fed did enough, that they should have hiked more. What's your response to that? So I don't I don't buy that at all. In fact, I in fact, I think once you get the funds rate to a certain level and you know, we could debate is that level four percent or or five percent. Once you get into obviously it's the real rate of interest again where inflation is. I don't think the Fed can do much on the service sector of the economy the, that is not terribly cyclical. But what it does, it creates a pernicious impact on the, on parts of the economy where we talked about small business, local banks, et cetera. And it's a question of how much do you want to create a skewed, distorted economy to try and get at something that is very difficult to get at. So I don't I don't agree with that at all. I think we'll see inflation come down over time. And really what the Fed should be concerned about, it's price stability. It's not a number. Price stability in the economy generally is pretty good. There are parts of it, auto insurance, healthcare, health insurance, et cetera, that are too high. But uh, but it's not because of a cyclical impulse. So no, I don't agree at all that they should have gone more. In fact, I don't I don't think you get that much of an impact. By the way, using the balance sheet is also an effective tool that they they utilize. And you've also said a couple of times here, two point six, two point seven percent is sort of the you know the end rate here. And, and if we get price stability at two point six, two point seven, is that going to be good enough for the Fed? Is that what you think we're going we're looking at for the long term here? So I think there's a couple of things. You know, that, you know, it's interesting listening to the discussion before about AI, and you think about what AI is. And by the way, you think about why corporate earnings have been so good. It's companies becoming more efficient, more productive. I think you're going to see an increase in productivity. By the way, you talk about how companies are becoming more productive and how going forward, how much labor do you utilize, how, how much SG&A do you utilize in your balance sheet. The reason why corporate earnings are good is they're being able to bring down costs because they're being more efficient. I think we're going to learn a lot over the next year or two how much that does that AI assimilate into the economy and allow for costs to come down? So longer term, I think it's when people project where longer term inflation is going to be, there are so many factors, global trade, et cetera, that factor in it. I think the only thing you could do today is say, gosh, we're running a bit higher inflation. I'm an investor, so what do I do? You can create income in portfolios that is extraordinary because you don't have to go out the yield curve. You can create six and a half, seven percent yielding portfolios in fixed income. And and uh, and by the way, and own equities 
which are not actually interest rate sensitive. You take the top seven, 10 companies in the S&P 500 today, they're not big borrowers to fund their business. So I think you can create a really good portfolio, a really efficient portfolio in today's economy with uh, with that in mind. And then you know where inflation goes 12 months, 18 months from now, two years from now, I think it's, it's hard to figure out. Rick, I'm just looking at the tenure here. We're at four, five, seven. Near to any immediate term, Rick, where do you think we head? So I think by the end of the year, that number's coming down. I think the 10-year note will come lower. I think alongside of some better inflation number, closer to the Fed bringing the, bringing the rate down. But I think it's in a range. And I think what you have to assume in a, in a portfolio today, 10-year longer-term interest rates could be a bit higher for a period of time. But you're creating, per the earlier comment, like you don't need to go out that long. You get so much yield in the three, four, five, two, three, four, five-year part of the curve. Things like investor credit, uh, great credit, et cetera. My sense is the rate, that 10 year rate will come down, but it could certainly, if we don't get corroborative data on inflation coming down, you could trend a little bit higher from, uh, from where we are today, certainly in long end interest rates. And, um, you know, what, what do you think is sort of the level that we're going to see that 10 year yield get to? So, I mean, I, th- I still think you're going to see the 10 year get down to four and a quarter, four percent. Um, over as the year progresses alongside of what we think will be uh, will be better data. But I listen, I wouldn't write off that you can move a bit higher from here in the interim. Again, I'm much more focused on let's build durable portfolios with income because, you know, today the Treasury's got to issue an awful lot of debt. Inflation is staying stickier or high. I just want to cre- keep creating income more in on the yield curve. Rick, for f- fixed income investors, investors who are listening right now, what would you avoid, Rick? So we've talked about long end interest rates. I think our, uh, you know, why do you need them? You know, you know, usually when you're a lender, when you're buying fixed income, when you're a lender, you usually have to go out the yield curve to take more risk to get more yield. You actually don't have to do that at all today. I don't know why. I don't think we need to do a lot there in uh, in today's environment. The other thing that I think is extraordinary about about today's dynamic, you don't need to stretch into things like weaker high yield. You don't need to stretch into weaker parts of emerging markets. You can buy quality assets. Now, I run a uh, ETF called uh, called Bink, where uh, you know we're using a lot of high quality assets with an average rating of high triple B, and we're still able to create what's close to 7%. I just don't think in an economy that's gonna moderate a bit, uh, that you need to really stretch into highly volatile assets today. Today, I just think clip a lot of coupon, clip a lot of yield, keep your risk in the equity market, which I still think equities are going higher. I think keep your risk in the equity market where you've got you've got some real upside alongside of you know companies cutting costs, keeping margins, and throwing off a lot of a lot of ROE, a lot of return on equity. I I keep your risk there today. Yeah, Rick, I was going to ask you about that. If you if the, what you were saying about risk went for equities as well, you mentioned a few moments ago that if you look at the largest companies in the S and P five hundred, they're throwing off a lot of cash. They have some of these characteristics you're looking for. I mean, that sounds sounds a little fangy again to me, or Magnificent Seven, or whatever you want to call it. Is that so, what you're talking about? So that's that was so we spend a minute on it. If you said today, so if you take, I think it's the the top twelve of the top twenty two companies, the S and P five hundred, throw off return on equity over thirty percent. Six of them throw off return on equity over sixty. That is extraordinary. If you can build a book value for equity that and that accelerated a fashion, it's pretty hard for the equity market to go up. Plus, they're also buying back a load of their stock uh, simultaneously. So it's pretty powerful from that. So yes, I like. I still like tech. You know, you evolve parts of, of tech where you go to, a, there's some parts of software tangential to, uh, to AI that, that I like quite a bit. Healthcare, I think you're gonna see, continue to see tremendous innovation in healthcare. By the way, the energy sector, uh, which I think is like a little bit of a dip today, the energy sector shows off real free cash flow generation makes a lot of sense. And then experiences. Airlines, <clears throat> some of the hotel, casino, I think the world is shifting. And you're seeing, you know, by the way, why is goods inflation negative, actually negative in the three months, six months moving average is negative. Why is service inflation higher? Things like arts and entertainment, et cetera, experiences. And I think orienting your portfolio in some of those spaces as well will continue to continue to be well supported. Yeah, we heard some of that commentary from the likes of Delta CEO along with their earnings. Uh, Rick Reeder, oh, it's always great to see you. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Appreciate it.